Hi all, I have another amazing game of Emmanuel Lasker to show you today. It's very, very positionally instructive in my view. So this is in the New York 1924 tournament. Let me introduce you to the players in case you haven't seen this amazing photo. Standing, there is Frank Marshall, the US champion. Savedi Tartakoa, he had many, many witty quotations. Gezar Moroxi, so as in the Moroxi bind, and he's one of the featured players here in this game today against the Manuel Lasker. So we have Alexander Alakine, Richard Retty, Pogolojabo, uh, we have Fred Yates, Jose Raul Capablanca, Janowski, Ed Lasker, not to be confused with the great Emmanuel Lasker. I mean, Ed Lasker's great as well, to be fair, but Emmanuel Lasker is even greater. So we're going to carry on this series looking at Emmanuel Lasker. Little series. Let's have a look at this game. So E4 from Geza Morozzi. And we have, in fact, a surprising first move by Lasker. He's never played this move before, ever. Knight F6. Why has he played it? There's a suspicion. Well, he might have mentioned it himself. He was watching in round two, five rounds before, uh, the disastrous game of Geza Morozzi against Alexander Alakine. Yes, Alexander Alakine had played the Alakine defense, Alakine's defense, in round two and destroyed Geza Morozzi. So there's an element of psychology here. I personally feel somehow my own understanding of Latska is transforming to win probability as opposed to psychologist. For me this fits in with like what neural networks do. They're, they're creating a win probability of past patterns and it's the context which is around Lasker's games which can help explain his play, his choices in the opening, his play generally even, could be based on win probability. Win probability is very contextually friendly so if Emmanuel Nasker knows Geza Marox is going to be uncomfortable, you know, as an uncomfortable reminder, it's like saying, oh, by the way, I'm going to remind you with this move, you get you got mashed in round two. Do you remember that? It's, going to, it's like saying that. It's like making it very uncomfortable. It, you could say, oh, it's naughty. It's, it's playing the person. But chess is a, is a person's game. It's not two computers playing against each other. So this contextual approach... Uh, you know, to take in, you know, for example, what if it was hot or the opponent didn't look tired? You might want a more tactical game. Is is that uh, not pure? You know, maybe you could, uh, the purists would argue, maybe Fisher, you, you want to just play the board. You don't want to take into account any context. But Fisher himself in the 1972 match, he he revealed a new repertoire, didn't he, with, with C4. Uh, and you know d4 systems basically transposing into d4 systems so there's, there's an argument to be made for this more contextual holistic approach to maximize win probability so knight f6 is like a a gentle sadistic reminder of round two for poor jezza so anyway we see knight c3 he had played d3 against alexander alakine uh in the earlier uh round so here knight c3 we have d5 after e5, we have a transposition, actually, to the French defense. After knight fd7, d4. If white plays knight takes d5, then knight takes e5. Black does have a very nice semi-open d file here. And, for example, with c5, that square d4 gives black an easy game. It looks like a very easy game in even position. Very nice control over that central square. So we have uh, d4. We're going into believe it or not, a French defence. Uh, so here we've got a French defence position, which has been seen many, many times in high-level modern master games. Knight f3, black castles, g3. We have c takes d4. A little bit more popular here is to maintain the tension in the centre with queen b6. Uh, for example, bishop h3, black can actually... Um, if f5, g4, but... Uh, there, there is interesting stuff with just taking actually an f6. This is a very interesting line, which I believe has been featured in, in Watson's classic book, Play the French. And this can be uh, is setting a trap actually for white. If white dares being uh, too materialistic, I've actually watched 
a super grandmaster in the making uh, Michael Adams go down to Andrew Mack I remember that vividly I was I was there in this tournament watching Adams I think snap up this second pawn and it falls into knight d takes e5 it's a total disaster scenario for white because of check and then rook d8 <laughs> and these very very nasty absolute pins for example it's a disaster so that is something a French defense player uh, in this variation needs to be aware of this possibility of sacking e6 and here, if white doesn't go to take the other pawn, which is kind of poisons, this position is um, going to be about even. Black can use the opportunity to get rid of the dark square bishops and have a very comfortable even position. So that's like modern theory, though. Okay, he didn't know about that idea, that whole idea of sacking the pawn, you know, of the bishop uh, h3. But uh, he played c takes. You could argue, well, it releases the tension. Okay, knight b6. We have, though, uh, a great idea coming up. Bishop h3, bishop d7, so holding e6 securely at the moment. Uh, in this position, a5 has been tried before in the game Atlas against Kinderman. Stefan Kinderman, Grandmaster 2500, uh, played with the black pieces uh, this, this way and eventually won uh, in 40 moves. That's an interesting stem game played in Germany 2014. But we, we see here bishop d7. Uh, white castles, rook c8. And now, uh, white is fundamentally weak on the adjacent light squares, actually. If we look at these adjacent light squares, look at these dark square pawns for a moment. There's something very, very interesting about Lasker's positional strategy. White does go in for a kind of attack, but this might not be the art of attack. This could be the disaster of attack this particular game uh, because in particular e4 is this actually a distant dream to try and get say this knight how would you on how on earth if you were to reverse engineer getting a knight from there to there how would you do that maybe you'd work out there's a route like this and there's a slight snag there there's a pawn on e5 depriving the use of d6 as a bouncing square this positional plan though does seem to be on the cards and portrayed with Lasker's next move f6 trying to undermine d6 and then this reverse engineered knight maneuver could could really be on the cards in reality another aspect of the position is white's light square pain if we just review the light squares again uh, you'll note that this pawn here if ever king h1 then this whole diagonal is pretty dangerous for the white king so this if that's removed at any point, sometimes this whole diagonal could ignite as well. So bear these positional considerations in mind. Essentially, potential light square disaster scenarios need to be factored in already after f6. Uh, the engines don't even rate f6, but it is a really fighting move. Queen c7, for example, rook f2, it seems as though white's going to get an easy time and play f5, very thematic. And very nice. This could be a very dangerous rolling attack. Uh, very, very dangerous with even like knight g3, h5, f6. It's very, very dangerous. So playing f6 seems to me a good fighting try in this position. We have e takes f6. So white now has that d6 square to play with at some point. Bishop takes f6, g5, bishop e7. And you'll note also, again, we've got pawns on the dark squares. And so the adjacent light square weaknesses are, are looking actually rather delicious, if I might say. We have king h1, another delicious possibility. If this pawn wasn't there, just imagine the pawn wasn't there, this whole diagonal would be very dangerous indeed for the white king. Perhaps better than that move is to deprive black the possibility of this knight tour to e4 by playing the killjoy move b3 to deprive the knight c4. And if a5, bishop e3, this should still be in the balance, this position, with white having uh, maybe a small advantage even. But king h1 is echoing not just light square potential weaknesses, but a target on the diagonal. A kind of, you could say, you could describe it as an obscure check is on the cards later, or a check, or just simply a check, or nasty checks on the diagonal. So we have knight c4, the knight is getting in to d6 it seems. 
knight c3. And in fact, we have bishop b4, which is basically saying black is prepared sometimes to give up the dark square bishop to weaken further e4 for this knight maneuver. And it could also have f5 as an option as well, or this one could have f5. There are very great opportunities for these knights on light squares. We have queen e2 looking at e6. That is protected. We have queen d3. And now knight d6. So the maneuvers are on. f5. This is looking a very desperate move, actually. Indeed. White's best shot, and this gets very, very tactical. If white has any dynamic chances, it seems the engine suggests g6. And for example, this, this situation where white might be able to sometimes consider using uh, the g file, uh, but it requires some imagination. After bishop takes d2, because of this kind of new diagonal of death, shall we say, that believe it or not, white has to go a piece down here with rook ad1 in this variation, uh, with some potential dynamic prospects like this, which is favoring white, or if black is more cautious here, uh, say bishop a5, uh, sorry, uh, after d5, uh, not taking there, but let's, let's go with bishop a5, and rook g1, white might have some compensation for the sacrificed piece. For example, uh, like this, where there is there is some dynamic possibilities. It's very, very chaotic, but white could potentially get some sort of situation where there's a perpetual check using that G file, basically. It's very, very dynamic stuff, and it seems the last chance saloon was this very tactical G6 for the implications on the G file, in a nutshell. Uh, so just to recap there, if uh, bishop d2, uh, knight e4, knight takes, but uh, d t if um, knight takes here, d takes, queen takes, bishop takes, if white plays here, you can see this diagonal of death already. If white plays knight takes d2, then knight takes d4 with the vicious bishop c6 being threatened. So if queen takes, bishop c6, and just taking the queen and so it's it's rather very very unpleasant indeed uh, so if rook a d1 yeah is the best shot yeah then black has to be careful here not not take here the better line is the bishop a5 as mentioned so anyway let's go back so we have after f5 white doesn't play g6 but plays f5 <laughs> there's major positional downsides here the rook is now a very well placed to try and use the e4 square itself sometimes we have knight takes f5 knight takes d5 yes a tactical move but as mentioned diagonal of death the use of d5 that's a fantastic square to use just opening up that diagonal against white's king here it's kind of weakening literally white's king safety to do this uh, we have rook f8 being played. Sorry, not being played. In this, in this situation, in this situation, this is very interesting. Rook f8 would have been the most accurate move. But bishop d6 was played, which is possibly the only inaccuracy that I feel that Laska played in this game. Putting the bishop back on d6. Maybe he, he liked the, the dark square bishop. If he had played rook f8, just to show you a gist of this position, if knight takes, knight takes, look at this rook as well. It's already well placed. These pieces are just asleep. C2 is a nice common square. Uh, this situation is just horrendous. It looks positionally like a nightmare for white. For example, like this, black's pieces are just absolutely fantastic. White has minimal uh, attacking opportunities. Um, so minimal attacking opportunities let's see uh, so we have um, though uh, bishop d6 not rook f8 we have white playing bishop takes f5 so there's a now even a marker pawn for this rook e4 white has been severely compromised on the light squares and the diagonal itself is vicious furthermore consider this white has just given up a light square bishop giving this light square bishop uh, without a, ca a counterpart there's no counterpart 
to this light square bishop. Uh, so once it gets on to that mega diagonal, it's going to be really, really vicious. We have uh, knight f4, and now there's a very, very nice looking rook e4 putting pressure on f4. We have queen b3 check. This is very desperate stuff from white. The king goes to h8, knight h4. Yeah, with these pieces at home, there aren't too many participants in this attack. It's only the queen and these two knights, really. Maybe this rook one day, but it all seems a bit too slow. In the meantime, this diagonal of death is ignited now. And <laughs> with knight takes d4 with tempo, it looks extremely vicious. Under these preconditions for the art of attack, or rather disaster of attack, it's going to be a mega disaster. Queen h3 is played. If knight hg6, this is just harmless after h takes. Uh, if knight takes g6, then just king h7. Yeah, the h7 square has been unveiled. And just king takes g6 here. It's harmless. So we have queen h3. Um, we have now uh, rook c2 getting on that 7th rank. So black's rooks are qualitatively very, very powerful here. And this bishop's just ready to spring on that extremely sensitive diagonal. It's essentially positional murder of the first degree, what we're witnessing here. White plays a very desperate g6. If knight h g6, then king g8. And what happens now? Where's the follow up? The knight will just have to go back. Rook takes f4 is on the cards. And then bishop c6 jack. And you can see it's a total massacre backfiring against white. So g6. We have bishop c6 now ready for a discovered check, either with rook takes or some else than other nasty discovered uh, attack. You can see the carnage now of the light squares revealed. We see knight f3. If g takes just to put something on the board there, rook takes f4, discovered check, and it's not going to end well after knight takes f3. Uh, for example, this winning the queen or pinning the queen, total disaster. So knight f3 is played. And we have uh, just h6, a desperate ploy now, knight e6. This is really not going to work, this attack. It's just taken uh, because after bishop takes h6, black is not at all obliged to take this bishop. The game um, actually ended here after this next move by Alaska. I wonder if you can get the move for 200 points. Black to play, totally crushing move. So you really need to get your preconditions right before going on to the attack. The preconditions are just totally disastrous for white hair. And black refutes the whole thing with what move? Can you see? Okay, the crushing rook h4 using that pins knight. Yeah, the power of the pin piece is illusionary. It's illusionary. The queen's on that. And white resigned here. Uh, just for the record, if G takes, that would be a very bad blunder by Laska standards. <laughs> Allowing a forced checkmate. He doesn't really want to do that. Uh, so, yeah, rook h4 is much stronger. In fact, extremely strong. Uh, so, if the game had continued, you know, queen takes, queen takes, there's nothing for white to do. It's just going to be checkmate pretty soon after. So I personally was not sure what was going on in this game. And then things started clicking for me personally. And I hope that's been revealed to you if you're a budding French defence player. Because I feel I got something for my own if I want to play the French defence. That f6 doesn't have to be connected, you might think, with f file counterplay. But simply undermining d6. And d6 can be connected with trying to pivot a knight into e4. And so that shows the importance of playing b3 from a white perspective to stop these kind of knight maneuvers on the light squares. The other point is, as Michael Steen says, the pawn is the fun pawns are the fundamental constraint on the pieces. The removal of that d5 pawn helped black along this diagonal of death, this newly appointed diagonal of death. Usually I'll call this diagonal the diagonal of death, but we had a newly appointed one with the removal of black's d5 pawn. Giving up the light square bishop, we know how destructive. Lasker is. When he has a bishop without a counterpart, he is a menace on the chessboard. And that bishop is a total menace 
in this uh, in this final scenario of this game. I hope you enjoyed it as much as me and got something out of it. Comments, questions, likes, shares, subscribes, uh, appreciated. By the way, sorry, addendum accuracy check as I'm doing with many Lasca games. Uh, it was it was kind of uh, average centre pawn loss. Um, uh, 52 I think from from <laughs> Jezar Moroxi here and from Lasker it was only 19 average center pawn loss super accurate again that's a consistent thing about Lasker's games if you check with computers accuracy is really really high okay and if you want to play me by the way at chess world kingscrusher.tv if you register there I'll be able to invite you for a game or bit.ly slash chess world there's a kingscrusher discord kingscrusher.tv slash discord to check out as well Thanks again. Cheers then.